There are apparently some rule changes that could be coming down the pipe in college football, and one of them could be of great service to Dow Loggins and South Carolina's offense. Our Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for the latest headlines and potential storylines on South Carolina Gamecock athletics. I'm Andrew Lyon, the host of this podcast and also the lead staff writer for Gamecocks Digest over on SI.com. Thank you for making Locked On Gamecocks your first listen or watch here today. We are free and available on YouTube and also wherever you get your audio podcast daily. I thank you all so much for bearing with me. I haven't been feeling that great over the last couple of days, but I'm finally bouncing back from whatever head cold I've had in the last 48 hours or so. So I'm really glad to be back and talk South Carolina sports with all of you But enough of all that, let's get all right into this Tuesday edition of Locked on Gamecocks. There are some rule changes that could be coming down the pipe for college football starting in the 2023 season. This has been mainly reported by Ross Dellinger of Sports Illustrated. So if you're interested in diving further into that whole discussion, I highly recommend you go check out the articles he has done regarding on all this. But For South Carolina and how these rule changes for the sport could affect them specifically, we're going to focus on one main rule change that could take place and potentially help Dow Loggins and South Carolina's offense by giving them an advantage over their opponents. So, in terms of the main rule change possibility that we're going to talk about on today's show, we're going to focus on one that almost completely aligns with the NFL's current rules regarding the clock. Because for college football, as of this current moment, when an offense gets a first down and the ball carrier or receiver remains in bounds, the clock ends up stopping until the referee ends up spotting the football on the new line of scrimmage. Which leads me into the rule change proposal that could happen soon for college football which would be that the clock would continue to run after an offense gains a first down, except when inside of two minutes remaining in an individual half. Now, to get into why this could be an advantage for Dow Loggins and South Carolina's offense, I want to take y'all back real quickly to a couple of tidbits that Dow Loggins gave at his introductory press conference back in mid-December regarding sort of what he wants this offense to look like, sort of what are a few things that this offense is going to be comprised of. And these were some of the things that he mentioned. Using the full space of the field, he sort of referred to it as space and pace. In terms of the space, that means all of the horizontal space on the field, along with everything vertically down the field, and combining that with pace, which Dow Locke is referred to as using tempo, but not just playing fast to play fast. We all know a couple of teams in college football that like to operate that way on offense. And the other thing that Dow Locke has mentioned was this. He's impressed with how quickly players can learn a signal or a one-word play call for an entire play, where basically they look to the sidelines and they see one hand signal and every single position group knows exactly what they need to do on that ensuing play. So how could these rule changes pertain to college football and more particularly South Carolina? Well, in terms of this specific rule change regarding the clock running after an offense gets a first down in bounds, this is going to put significantly more pressure on each team's defense. If anything, it's going to make defensive football more of a priority now in college football. You are no longer going to be bailed out by having some time saved up for your offense to muster a response to your opponent if your team cannot stop your opponent over and over and over again continuously throughout the course of a football game. So getting back to South Carolina, why would they have an advantage with this rule change? Well, the answer lies within their recent hired offensive coordinator in Dow Loggins, whom I know, again, has really created some polarizing opinions in South Carolina's fan base regarding the hire. But 
you cannot deny this. Dow Watkins has a ton of experience from his time in the NFL in terms of abiding by some of these rules that could potentially now be implemented in college football. He has had to abide by these rules for over almost a decade as an NFL offensive play caller. And now he gets to go to the college ranks and he gets to use the entirety of the field and speed a little bit more easily to catch opposing defenses off guard. Something that is a little bit more difficult to do when you're coaching in the professional ranks. You combine this with Dow Loggett's perceived understanding of the importance of quick and efficient play calls through hand signals, through one word calls, instead of you know making the quarterback have to go up to the line of scrimmage and have to make six, seven different checks before they can even snap the football South Carolina's offense could now be farther ahead of the curve in terms of how they fully take advantage of these potential rule changes, which I believe now are actually about to be proposed to executive committees in college football. And this could subsequently put more pressure on an opposing team's offense, not just their defense. As opposing offensive coordinators now, if they face a team maybe that's coached by Dow Loggins, that has success in these new rule changes, they're going to have to find ways to respond. And as we've all seen, coaches can prepare and strategize as much as they would like leading into a game. But it's interesting to see how sometimes some of those plans can get thrown out of a window when you're in the middle of a football game. You can't plan for an opponent basically driving down the field on your defense nonstop. You cannot plan for X amount of points being scored by your opponent. And so for South Carolina, if they can do what they did last year in some of these games like they did against Tennessee and Clemson, and a couple of others as well, and be more efficient on the offensive end to where they're not basically one of two extremes where they're either scoring on every other drive or they're just stuck in the mud and they quite literally are struggling to get a first down. If South Carolina can be at least a little bit more in the middle, maybe lean more towards the better end of that spectrum with Dow Loggett's experience under these rules, then opposing offensive coordinators that they face, they could feel more pressure. It could cause them to press a little bit more than they would have originally planned to do so. And here's the thing. When looking at South Carolina's schedule for 2023, and opposing offensive coordinators who also might be able to adapt a little bit better to some of these rule changes should they get passed by these committees, the only two coordinators that stick out in this particular aspect are Bobby Petrino at Texas A&M, because he had one year where he was the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons 16 years ago, and Liam Cohen of Kentucky, who of course has developed plenty of years of experience, and last year happened to get a year of experience as the offensive coordinator for the Los Angeles Rams. Those are the only two that, along with Dow Lawkins, just based on South Carolina's schedule, might be able to adjust to these rule changes a little bit more quickly than others. So, Again, reverting back to my original point, these rule changes, no matter what you think of them, no matter what you think of how this could change the game of college football, maybe them trying to basically replicate what the NFL does, maybe they're doing this for money instead of player safety, no matter what your opinion is regarding that side of the equation, when looking specifically at South Carolina, and in terms of the clock continuously running after every first down, besides first downs that occur within two minutes of the end of a half, this could really bode well for South Carolina's offense and Dow Loggins subsequently. This could get South Carolina a leg up. Now, does this mean that South Carolina's going to automatically win 10-plus games? Does it mean they're automatically going to score 40-plus points a game? No, it does not. Obviously, the team still has to go out there, and they still have to be able to string consecutive plays together in order to really take full effect, full advantage of, of these rule changes. But if they can do so, especially earlier on in the season during a really tough stretch of games where the Gamecocks have opponents like North Carolina in Charlotte, they play Georgia on the road, then they play Mississippi State back at home before they travel on the road again to take on the Tennessee Volunteers. Their ability to adjust to this one rule in particular could literally make or break this team in terms of games that end up coming down just a couple of possessions. And if they can adjust well in those particular instances, then you have to give Dow Loggins and South Carolina a leg up 
in this regard. So again, no matter what you think of these rule changes overall, a couple of them could really serve South Carolina well in 2023, should they, of course, be approved by the executive committees of college football. Now, South Carolina's football program is less than a month away from being able to take the practice field once again and be able to get a better idea of sort of what kind of team they have at this point. One team, however, that's not going through that process right now is South Carolina's women's basketball team, who is nearing the finish line of the regular season. And in a way, they showed that this past Sunday afternoon against the Ole Miss Rebels as they narrowly defeated Ole Miss in overtime. What all led to that final result? We're going to dive into all of that in just a couple moments right here on Locked on Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Built Bar. Now, if you're looking for a delicious treat, maybe something that can help you be a little bit more healthier because maybe you've realized, you know, I need to get out of the house a little bit more. I need to start going back to the gym. I need to start exercising once again, which I have certainly learned the hard way over the last couple of days with me feeling a little bit under the weather myself then obviously you got to want a really good protein bar, something that's going to taste well, something that's going to be enjoyable, but also something that is going to give you everything that you're looking for. And if you're looking for that kind of bar, you've got to try Built Bar. It's 130 calories. It only has 4 grams of sugar and includes a whopping 17 grams of protein. And you can get these bars at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. If you go to Walmart, go to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a 4-bar box that includes multiple flavors like cookies and cream, double chocolate, and coconut puffs. If you go to Sam's Club, you can grab a 13-bar box that includes flavors like brownie batter and churro. No matter where you can get these bars or whatever flavors you like, I promise you, you're not going to regret choosing Built Bar. You will thank me later because Built Bar is where tasty is the new healthy. Welcome back to this Tuesday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. Thank you for making Locked On Gamecocks your first listen here today. Make sure you check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball, where you'll find everything you need to know about college basketball in just one place. Plus, you'll hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and also players. Locked On College Basketball is available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. South Carolina's women's basketball team almost fell to their opponent for the first time in 33 straight tries dating back to March of this past calendar year. As the South Carolina Gamecocks survived, and I mean quite literally survived, in overtime against the Ole Miss Rebels on Sunday afternoon, winning by a final score of 64-57. to Obviously, this was a game that if you follow the women's basketball team closely enough and the sport of women's college basketball as a whole, that you probably felt like that this game might not be quite as much of a cakewalk as some of these other SEC games have been for South Carolina. But I certainly don't think that anybody expected this game to be as close as it was at the end. And the reason why that ended up being the case was this. South Carolina, plain and simple, didn't play their game on Sunday. Ole Miss, defensively, they played a bit of a quasi-zone type defense. And what I mean by that is this. They kind of played basically defense between sort of a man-to-man and a zone defense. It was basically somewhat of a 1-1-3 where everyone was sort of sagging off a little bit of their matchup. And the emphasis was quite easy to decipher. We're not going to let you have an easy entry pass to the baseline, down on the low block where Leah Boston and Camilla Cardoso are hanging out and trying to get some open looks. Essentially, the Rebels wanted South Carolina to take more jump shots. And at least in the first quarter, they were able to do that. They forced South Carolina to play the game that they wanted to play. The defending national champions... I'm not sure if it was the road environment that they were playing in. I'm not sure if season fatigue is starting to really accumulate with them at this point and it's catching up. But either way you slice it, for whatever reason, this team just sort of decided to 
towed the line that their opponent wanted them to on Sunday. And from the onset, you could sort of tell that this game was not going to be as easy for South Carolina to get through because of some of the decisions that they were making. South Carolina didn't take care of the basketball on Sunday afternoon. They had 15 turnovers compared to Ole Miss's nine for the game. And here's the thing. Even by some of the slimmest of margins, South Carolina won every other major statistical category in this contest, except for turnovers. It goes back to an old coaching cliche, which is if you do not take care of the basketball, the football, whatever it is for whatever sport you play, then you can lose to anybody on any given day. And that almost happened to South Carolina. The Gamecocks, again, they just sort of did what Ole Miss wanted them to do, which is they played a little bit more isolation ball. Carolina's guards at times decided to just try to make a play for themselves and drive into areas where sometimes there was two, if not three, Ole Miss Rebel defenders sitting right there waiting for them. And either they would try to get a shot off and have the ball swatted out of their hands and it would be a turnover for the Rebels, or a Rebel defender would get her hands in there and it would turn into a scrum fest over the basketball and it would be a jump ball and... Weirdly enough, almost every jump ball when South Carolina was on offense seemed to go Ole Miss's way. There was a lot of jump balls in this contest. It was a very physical matchup between these two teams. So, again, South Carolina, because they fell in line with what Ole Miss wanted them to do, it really ended up costing them multiple offensive possessions in this game. And here's the other thing. South Carolina, after the first quarter, they did try to... Put more of an emphasis on getting the ball near the baseline again to the front court, to Aaliyah Boston, Camilla Cardoso, Victoria Saxton, and everybody else in that area of the floor. But because of Ole Miss's pressure, because of how many defenders at times they had hovering around the front court players South Carolina had on the floor at that moment in time, Carolina's guards at certain points, they actually found ways to overthrow quite literally everybody. There was two or three passes in the game where a Carolina guard tried to make a pass to Camilla Cardoso, which it's hard to overthrow her, or Leah Boston, and the ball quite literally hit the backboard, went back into the court of play, and an Ole Miss defender wound up getting her hands on it, and it basically wound up being a turnover. Happened on multiple occasions, which again, you have to give credit to Ole Miss's defense, but at the same time, South Carolina made a lot of at least 50% unforced errors in this game. Errors that we're not used to seeing from this team. A couple more points from this game. South Carolina had to lean heavily on their star players. And obviously, I know some of you are sitting there and thinking, Andrew, that's the way every single sports team operates. You're going to lean on your star players, especially when it comes down to games like this. And I understand that to a certain degree. But here's the thing. Aaliyah Boston... Zaya Cook, Bree Beal, and Camila Cardoso, probably the four most productive players in terms of stats on this team, were responsible for 53 of the team's 64 points. Going into this game, South Carolina's entire bench had accounted for 47.7% of the team's total offense in terms of points per game, which I believe, doing the math real quickly, worked out to be around 39 points per game heading into their contest against the Ole Miss Rebels. The bench, quite honestly, just did not completely show up in this game. And again, that's not a bad thing because the bench is not going to be able to always help out the starters like they have for the majority of games in this season. But for the starters to have to score almost 80%, 85% of the team's points on offense... That's not a winning formula right there. It's just not, especially when you get into games like a Stanford or a UConn, maybe an LSU rematch in the tournament, or, heck, gosh knows, if you play Ole Miss in your own region in the NCAA tournament. All it takes is one off night for that big of a portion of this team, and South Carolina's going home. And they're not winning their second straight national championship, even though they have proven up to this point in this season that they are the best team in college basketball. There's a reason why that they have not lost a game in almost a whole calendar year up to this point. And this leads into my last point, competing. 
South Carolina finally faced a team that competed on the boards. Ole Miss only had one player that was taller than six foot two on their roster coming into this game. That did not matter. Ole Miss, as a collective unit, scrapped and clawed for rebounds. And they ended up getting their fair share. South Carolina, I believe, still out-rebounded the Rebels by 11 boards. But here's the other problem. South Carolina, admittedly in conference play, has gotten away with constantly missing easy baskets near the rim. But because of their overall height and length in the front court, being able to rebound their own misses, put the ball back up until the ball goes into the hoop. On Sunday, that did not happen as much. And Ole Miss was a big factor in that playing out the way it did. And so South Carolina, basically, if they weren't making their first shot at times, they, to their own surprise, actually had to go back to the end of the floor and they weren't getting a second chance like they're used to in these games. So what did this game show for South Carolina overall? When you go away from what's worked for you up to this point in the season and you play right into your opponent's hands, you can easily lose that game. Ole Miss gave South Carolina one heck of a fight. There's no question about that. They've got good things going on over there in Oxford. Coach Yo and the Rebels, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with in this conference in the next 10, 15 years or so based on what she has done with that program. But I got to say, I still feel like to a certain degree that this was a game that South Carolina nearly gave away because of the way that they played, because of the fact that, again, they let Ole Miss dictate the way that this game played out. You're South Carolina. You're known for having one of the deepest teams in all women's college basketball. You haven't lost a game in 32 straight tries leading into that matchup. There's no reason for that to happen. None. So South Carolina got a massive scare. Looking back, this could be a scare that they needed. They got this once or twice last year. They wound up winning the national championship. So maybe in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter as much. But got to say, there were definitely some signs of concern to have with the Gamecocks coming out of this contest. Now, the Gamecocks still overall had a really good weekend in terms of winning all of their matchups with the major sports teams. And another major sports team that did quite well this weekend was South Carolina's baseball team, who swept UMass Lowell, and they had a couple of major storylines coming out of that series sweep. We'll dive into all of that in just a couple moments right here on Locked on Gamecocks. Today's show is also brought to you by LinkedIn. As a small business owner or hiring manager, you know that success in 2023 all depends on the team members that you surround yourself with. You're only as good as the people underneath you, the people that you are working with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs, because you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, the values, and the experiences to help you achieve your goals. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus other leading competitors in the industry, because LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Once again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free today. Terms and conditions do apply. Welcome back to today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your team every single day in just 30 minutes. South Carolina's baseball team got off to a fantastic start against UMass Lowell this past weekend as they defeated the River Hawks in blowout fashion on Friday, Saturday, and also Sunday. Obviously, there are a ton of good things that took place for Mark Kingston and his squad this past weekend. We don't have enough time to dive into everything, but there are a couple of main storylines to take away from this past weekend. The first one I'm going to talk about is Jack Mahoney's return to the pitching mound on Sunday afternoon. And Jack Mahoney, with his performance on Sunday, he may have solidified himself as South Carolina's third starter in that weekend rotation. His stat line for this game was phenomenal. In five and two-third innings pitched, Mahoney only gave up five hits, zero runs, nine strikeouts on 76 total pitches. 
This was an impressive and efficient outing from Jack Mahoney in terms of his composure after the initial first inning emotions and also the stuff that he was throwing to Cole Messina at home plate. He was locating his fastball really well on both sides of the plate, inside and out. And his fastball also had plenty of velocity, usually measuring out somewhere in the mid-90s, 94, 95, 96 miles per hour. He also had solid breaking stuff on the outside part of the plate, in particular when he was facing right-handed batters especially. And this was something that admittedly coming into this season, I had not necessarily concerns, but questions about. Because I'll be honest, I had not really seen too many scrimmages since the initial few that took place this past fall for South Carolina's baseball team. But I did see Jack Mahoney pitch this past fall. And with what I had seen initially, Mahoney was solid with his fastball. But whenever he had to go to his breaking balls, the second, third, and fourth pitches in his arsenal, I felt like that Mahoney's stuff kind of fell off a little bit. I felt like that his command wasn't completely there. I felt like that he was getting himself into a lot of deeper counts. And... I have to admit, when he was announced as the third starter for this past weekend's rotation, part of me was kind of sitting there and feeling like, you know, Mahoney, I guess, could be a good starter. But at the same time, I think he could be a fantastic middle reliever. I think he'd be a fantastic closer or setup man for South Carolina in the bullpen. And um, I was completely wrong about that because based on what he did this past Sunday, again, against UMass Lowell, which obviously is not going to be the best competition that South Carolina plays this season, but... Considering the fact that it was his first time pitching in a live game in 656 days, you can't ask for much better from Jack Mahoney in his first start this season. So kudos to him. Really, really just great to see him be able to finally get back out there and do what he loves, which is pitching for the South Carolina Gamecocks in front of of Gamecock Nation and his family and friends who were in attendance for that game. The other storyline coming out of this series against UMass Lowell has to be the team's overall approach at the plate. The batting lineup was just as good, if not better, than the pitching staff this past weekend. South Carolina as a team hit 14 home runs against the Riverhawks this weekend, scoring 49 runs altogether. They drew 18 walks as a team, with Carson Horning drawing five walks and Evan Stone drawing four walks by themselves individually. And the team as a whole batted 393 this past weekend. What does all this come back to? It comes back to the plate discipline and the approach that is being taught by Monty Lee. And Mark Kingston has sort of alluded to this in the past week or so, but apparently Monty Lee, in terms of being a hitting coach, he is very individually based in terms of sort of how he goes about teaching some of these guys on the team. He does not basically take the same sort of approach and try to use it as a carbon copy for every single guy in the lineup and on the roster. He adjusts based on the kind of player that he is talking to, based on what their strengths are, what some of their weaknesses might be, and he does that for every single player. And I think that that showed itself this past weekend against UMass Lowell. And again, UMass Lowell, they are not going to be the best team South Carolina plays all season. But I will say this, it is really difficult for an offense to score 49 runs total in three games to start a season against a team that, yes, while a mid-major team was one game away from making the NCAA regionals this past summer. UMass Lowe is not a terrible mid-major program. They are pretty staple, as a matter of fact. They returned the majority of their batting lineup from this past year. Had a couple really solid pitchers that came back for this season. Their head coach is coming into his 19th season at the helm for the Riverhawks. This isn't some startup mid-major team that won like six games a year ago that they were facing. South Carolina was facing, again, decent competition for their first weekend. And... They passed every test with flying colors against the River Hawks. So, this South Carolina baseball team, I think it's fair to say after this past weekend, has definitely got Gamecock fans' hopes up for this upcoming season. One that, again, could be quite good for South Carolina. Everybody knew that the pitching staff was going 
to be quite deep. But some of the questions that they still had surrounded the hitting lineup and how are guys going to be able to handle pitching this season? What are some of these new faces going to do for this team? Will McGillis, he hit three home runs this weekend. Gavin Casas, I believe, hit two or three home runs himself. Dylan Brewer, I believe, hit one out. Talmadge LaCroix looks really good over at third base. Comasina did a good job at the catcher position. Looks like somebody that is going to have really good chemistry with South Carolina's starting pitchers. So this is a team that after just a few games this season is looking more and more like a team that could do better than just making the NCAA regionals. They could make the super regionals. Who knows? If they catch some fire and they get some other things figured out, Maybe they can even make it back to Omaha, which will be the program's first appearance in 11 seasons. It's obviously something that Gamecock fans have been dying to see for quite some time. And this could be the team for Mark Kingston that gets South Carolina back into the discussion for Omaha. A discussion that this program deserves to be in every couple of years or so. But with that being said, y'all, that is going to do it for today's show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. I hope y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show as always. What are your thoughts on these potential rule changes coming down the pipe in college football and how they could affect South Carolina, particularly the one about the clock running after a first down is gained offensively? Also, what were your thoughts on Don Staley and South Carolina's women's basketball team's narrow escape against Ole Miss this past weekend? And what were your thoughts on Mark Kingston's baseball squad and what they did against UMass Lowell, both in terms of pitching and hitting at the plate? Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section if you're watching today's show on YouTube, or you can shoot me a direct message at a line underscore SC on Twitter, and I'll try to respond to your comments as quickly as I see them. And once again, don't forget to make Locked On College Basketball your second listen or watch now that you have watched or listened to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. But again, y'all, that does it for me on today's show. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, and I will catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.